Rabbi Shay Stab, welcome to Jewish Money Matters. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. You, you know, we are so blessed to have you because you are a leading voice in the Jewish world, particularly when it comes to understanding the inner dimension of our material existence, of our interactions with the world around us, everything through the lens of Hasidic philosophy. So it's a real treat that we get to discuss such an important, such a crucial topic as money and finance with an expert in Jewish spirituality like yourself. So thank you for the opportunity. And I would like to get started with the try to un let's try to unpack the idea of material abundance when you and i first connected we started discussing the topic of the show and we said wow the spirituality of material abundance and there's so much confusion around this um in the jewish world unfortunately where on the one hand we all know we need abundance to serve god in the world we need material we need money right and and ultimately we all want it and yet there's like so much guilt and shame around this. So why don't you get us started with the right perspective? What is the perspective that we need to have um, as Jews regarding abundance? Yeah. So that's such a deep question. I love it. You're just going right into the deep stuff. Okay. Because <laughs> I think it's time. a game changer, right? This is a game changer. Like if people grasp this, it can change everything for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like you said, there are a lot of misunderstandings surrounding this idea, a lot of confusion. And uh, if you get the right perspective, it changes everything. Yeah, yeah. And not just the perspective, which is a cognitive shift, but the emotional shift that follows the cognitive shift, like you were mentioning the guilt and the shame, and you know, the f feeling awkward and not really knowing how to relate emotionally, I'm saying to to my own relationship with, with wealth, and uh, so it's a cognitive emotional thing. Okay, mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about it like this. Let's try to make it really, really simple. It's a very deep concept, but let's try to make it really, really simple. Um, you have a soul and a body, or you are a soul and you have a body. So you can't reject your relationship with the material world and material things any more than you can reject your relationship with your body. It's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your soul was sent to this world, which is a physical world. It's not the only world, but this is the physical world in order to carry out a mission that can only be carried out here. So the first thing is to realize that you're here for a purpose and that purpose is inherently bound up with dealing with physicality, starting with your own physicality, your embodiment, mm -hmm. and in concentric circles outward with your immediate possessions, like your home, and then ultimately all of the material resources in the world that you're going to interact with. So it's sort of an, uh, the, I think the first thing to accept is this is unavoidable. You can go sit on a mountaintop and take an oath of poverty and you can be an ascetic and you can reject, you can attempt to reject physicality. But as long as you're in this world, physicality is unavoidable. You have a body, mm -hmm. you have to eat, you have to breathe, you have to sleep. And by extension, you have to have some relationship with material resources. Mm -hmm. And I think before we even talk about what the nature of that relationship is and what a healthy relationship with materiality should look like, let's first accept you have to have a relationship. It's unavoidable. And not only unavoidable, like a necessary evil, but that's why your soul came to this world. So that's premise number one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far so good. You're with me? So far so good. So okay. far so good. All right. Now let's talk about, all right, now that I accept that I have to have some type of relationship with the material world around me and its resources, what does a healthy relationship look like? So he, here's the thing. There, there are two different 
questions you could ask. What and why? Mm -hmm. What is a very simple question, relatively simple question. What is this thing? And we have different ways we can describe something. We could describe it by its weight or its height or its color, or it, 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 it's, uh, it does, it, you could describe it also in maybe more uh, philosophical terms like aesthetics. Is it beautiful? Is it ugly? But we have descriptive terms to, to describe the what. What is this thing? Then there's a deeper question, which is why. Mm -hmm. Why is this thing? Or maybe more, more pertinent, why is this thing in my life right now? So the question to ask is not what do you want to have? The question is why? Why do you want to have it? And to answer the why, you need to have a mission. Once you know your mission, like, let's say, um, my mission is hospitality, to have mm -hmm. an open home, guests who come to town always can come for a meal. Okay, fine. Let's say that's your mission. Let's say you're right about the fact that that's your mission. So then when you tell me that you need a big house, you have your why. Yeah. But just to say, I want a big house because it's a big house. Well, you're telling me the what, you're not telling me the why. Or it, it, let's say that your role is, is to teach. So you say, I need a clear mind, and therefore I need to be physically healthy, and I need to have a minimal amount of emotional stress, and I need to uh, not be burdened with having to, uh, to, to, to focus too much on, on uh, mundane matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you're not just telling me a what, like, I want to be healthy, I want to be stress free, and I want to have enough money not to have to worry so much about making a living. That's the what. But now you're telling me the why. Oh, because I need a clear head, because I want to be able to focus on thinking and teaching and relating deep ideas. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you could go on and on with different examples, but to answer the why, why do you have a relationship with this particular material material resource, whether it be physical health or a house or a car or, or money in your bank account, why do you have the relationship? In order to answer the why, you have to have a mission and a sense of what that mission is. Mm -hmm. So basically what we come down to is um, before we can really have a healthy relationship with materiality, we have to start thinking about purpose. Once mm -hmm. you know your purpose, then you will see the purpose in the things around you. And then you can be selective about employing which things have which purposes <laughs> that are aligned with your purpose. And therefore, they're not dead weight that are getting in your way, but they're actually enhancing and, and supporting your mission. But it, just to, to simplify it for the person who's listening and saying, oh my gosh, but these two individuals are probably so clear about their mission in life. And mm -hmm. it's taken me a lifetime. And by the way, we are not, we're also working on it every single day, right? It's something we work on throughout our lives. Should we suggest to people that if, if you don't, you're not super clear on your mission yet, at the very least, you have to understand that you're you're here to serve your creator, that there's there's a why that is intrinsically connected with your creator above. Yeah. So, you know, there's a general mission and there's a specific mission. Mm -hmm. so a specific mission is as unique as you are. Yeah. But then there's the general mission, which is, you know, we're all here for um, um, in the in the macrocosm, you know, it's like it's one goal. We're all mm -hmm. here to perfect the universe that's the collective goal now what's my particular niche in perfecting the universe okay that, that that's another discussion but let's just begin with the idea and maybe like build on it. it's a process and like mm -hmm. I, I like what you said that you know i yes definitely will admit that being in tune with my mission is a constantly evolving process um your particular mission the way it manifests 
changes from year to year in your life, sometimes from day to day, and you have to be open to that and you have yes. to be flexible. Um, but the general concept never changes. And that is my creator would not have troubled my soul to come down into this limitation called embodiment mm -hmm. if I didn't have some contribution to make in making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we get into the idea of specific mission, we can talk about that. How can people try to start to key in on, on their specific mission? But yes, we have to embrace the idea of a, of a general mission. Like I'm here to make the world a better place. I'm right. here to improve things. So first of all, just open your eyes. Where do you see an opening for a contribution? See, I, I think maybe let's back up a second. When people think about about material resources, I think they look at it completely backwards. They look around, they try to see, where do I have an opportunity to get something, to amass something, to acquire it? Yes, That's all wrong. Don't look at it that way. Where do I have an opportunity to contribute something? And once I have that clear, then whatever resources I need in order to make my contribution, that stuff is going to flow almost seamlessly as long as I'm on mission. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, and one of those resources is wealth. It's money. It's that it's guilt. <laughs> it's that what you need to keep, to raise your kids, to keep a roof over your head and everything else. Now, let me ask you this because you and I love what you're saying. It's so, it feels so aligned with what we both believe. We both, you know, and, you know, come from a, Chabad perspective and approach this here, but there are still, and I get this a lot from my listeners, these calls with these aha moments about something that's been said on the show. And they say, I was raised for, with a completely different perspective. There's like two schools of thought within Judaism where one is akin to almost saying like piety means poverty equals poverty, or it means staying away from money or any material pursuits, right? And then there's what you just described. You are here to contribute. You are here to be in the world. You're not here to go and sit somewhere and shun away from it. How do we reconcile these two perspectives or should we not even reconcile them? <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, you know, let's say you're coming from a perspective where you see uh, like you said, poverty is synonymous with piety. Okay. And presumably why? Because you're looking at it like, well, you know, it's, it's like crass to want to have nice things, right? No, I, I, I don't want nice things. All right. So let's, let's explore that worldview a little bit. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of the term spiritual materialism? No, tell me, what is it? <laughs> spiritual materialism means that you're into amassing wealth just for the heck of it but it's spiritual wealth instead of material wealth mm -hmm. so is that any less crass i mean maybe slightly less crass but is it any less self-centered wow okay so if i want to have a nice car for no other reason than to have a nice car, not because I want to drive carpool, not because I want to, you know, take uh, food packages to the poor. No, I just want to have a nice car to have a nice car. Okay, I want an acquisition for the sake of the acquisition. All right, so we all know that that's pretty hollow. Mm -hmm. What if I want to have a spiritual acquisition just for the sake of having it? Right, so is that less shallow and self-centered? No, I mean, you're just upgrading. You're just having slightly better taste. Mm -hmm. so instead of wanting something material, which is fleeting, you want something spiritual, which has more staying power, but it's still self-centered. What I'm saying is flip the whole thing. It's not about material or spiritual. It's about selfish or selfless. Yes. Okay. So let's flip the whole thing. I'm not here to acquire anything for me. I'm here to be useful. And in the course of being useful, there are various different material and spiritual resources that I will make use of for my mission. But none of it is, is about acquisition. None of it is about me just amassing material or spiritual accomplishments. It's all about contribu contribution. That's all it is. It's contribution by giving, 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 giving. And in the course of giving, yeah. I'm going to need spiritual and material resources. Spiritual resources, you know, meaning I'm, 
I can't transmit something that I don't have. So if I want to be a teacher and I want to inspire, inspire others, so I have to have my own inspiration, right? That's a spiritual resource. Not just because I want to have the acquisition of spiritual uh, enlightenment. No, because it's a resource that I need in order to, to do my mission. The mm -hmm. same thing with a material resource that things cost money, you know, even to maintain an online platform, even if you don't have a brick and mortar where, you know, you don't have that kind of overhead, but everything costs money, everything costs money. So in order for me to do my mission, I need material resources, not because I'm interested in acquisition for acquisition's sake, but because these resources are necessary in promoting my best ability to contribute. So what I would say to people who are sort of confused about, you know, like they have this inherent guilt about, about the material. So uh, what, uh, the first thing I would say to them is, why do you have less guilt about the spiritual? <laughs> you could be a crass materialist for material wealth. You could be a crass materialist, quote unquote, for spiritual wealth. The, 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 <laughs> the solution isn't to, to run off and focus on spirituality instead of materiality. The solution is actually much bigger than that, to flip the paradigm mm -hmm. from selfish to selfless, from what, what can I get to what can I give? And mm -hmm. once you're focusing what I can give, then what guilt is there in having an abundance of resources, spiritual and material? Yes, spot on. Now, there is, we just discussed that, those two extremes, right? But then there's, this other subtle thing that creeps up where people say, well, I just, I just need enough to get mm. by. I don't need to ask for more. I should be happy with what I have. What do we say to that? Is there any virtue in, how, in, in this type of thinking? One second. Hold on. I'm on a Zoom thing right now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Are we, we're, we're able to cut that, right? Yeah, I'll cut it. No, no worries. Okay. Um, fine. What were you saying? Uh, I'm going to answer the question. Um, uh, wait, so re re just should I ask it, it again? Oh, just remind me what it was. Yeah, we just discussed this these two extremes, right? But but there's also something a little bit more subtle that creeps in, which is that people tend to say things like, "Well, I just I just need enough. I need enough to get right, by. Right, right. I don't need to ask for more. I just I should be happy with what I have." What right. do we say to that? Is there any virtue in that? Right. So first of all, you should be happy with what you have. Mm -hmm. You should always be grateful and satisfied with what you currently have. But there's a difference between now and a minute from now. So what do I have now? Clearly God knows what he's doing. Clearly mm -hmm. whatever I need from my mission now I have. But then there's something called goals, ambitions, dreams. So if your mission is big, then the resources that you're going to need in order to accomplish the mission are also big. So let's say I need to raise, uh, <laughs> not to say an, an actual number, maybe I will say it. Let's say I have to raise $200,000 a year, okay? Mm -hmm. now, the truth is probably I have to raise more, but in my yeah. mind, I, I picked the number that I was just the minimal amount of uncomfortable with that I could get comfortable with, you know, the, you know, the fear of, having to fundraise. But let's say I have to fundraise $200,000 a year. Okay. So let's say I don't have that. Let's say I don't have a dollar of it yet. All right. So I have to be okay with that because God runs the world. He knows what I need. I'm taken care of. Mm -hmm. Everything is bread from heaven. You know, the manna didn't stop falling in the desert. It's still falling every day. And the manna was, it fell however much they needed for that day. You couldn't keep it over from one day to the next. Okay. That's the way it is. Every day we turn to our creator and he gives us what we need for that day. Okay, so I'm not going to get nervous. I'm not going to be despondent. I'm good. I'm very happy. I'm very grateful for today. Mm -hmm. I also have a plan. And my, my plan for the year involves this program and that program. And I know what the budget is. And so I have a goal of $200,000. And the truth is, if I'd have a bigger financial goal, I'd have, a, I'd have more programming goals as well. I could always expand that. I should expand it. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think... You have to distinguish between being satisfied right now and having ambition for 
tomorrow and a year mm -hmm. from now and 10 years from now. And as long as that ambition is mission driven, there should be no shame in that whatsoever. Now, if the ambition, going back to what we were talking about before, about, about selfish uh, goals, if the ambition is just, I have this aspiration to achieve this goal just for my own, I don't know, sense of, I could say that I did it. I don't think that's deeply satisfying to a human soul. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone can really be fulfilled um, that deeply. I, there's a certain... A, uh, fulfillment of accomplishing a goal, any goal, just, you know, you could just say, I'm going to throw this uh, wad of paper across the room and try to make it land in the, in the garbage basket on the first try. Yeah, I did it. Right. There's a little thrill in accomplishing something you set out to do, but I'm saying as a, as a way of life, just accomplishing something for the sake of accomplishing it isn't profoundly satisfying. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to have a mission, which means what they're accomplishing, what they're giving. So when that's clear, then to the contrary, think big, dream big, and then your budget's going to be big. And you're, you're going to go out and you're going to bring in the resources that you need for, for, mm -hmm. for, for the mission. So again, for right now, whatever I have right now is great. It's more than great. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful. Thank you. But what do I need tomorrow, a month from now, a year from now? And it should be that well planned out. Right. There, there's a number. There's definitely a number I have to hit. And there's no contradiction between those two things. And I think what you just reminded me when you were saying about the fact that I accept what I have right now, I'm grateful. I accept that whatever God is doing in this moment is right and it's good for me. And yet I have ambition. Yet I believe that that could be different the next minute brings us to this intersection between emuna, belief, and prayer, right? We're allowed to pray for that that we're working towards, for that that we want. I remember I had a student who once told me, yeah, El, I just, I've never had an issue praying. When I pray, I pray for Shalom Bayit, for peace at home. I pray for Nahat for my children. I pray for all the health. Like we, we pray for everything. It would never occur to me to pray for wealth, to pray for material prosperity. But yet we're saying here, there's, there's room for prayer here. Yeah, well, is there? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, if you look, if you look in our prayers, we specifically mention uh, material prosperity. That's one of the. I'm talking, if, talk, if you look in the Jewish prayers, if you look at the the three prayers that we that we pray every day, and the eighteen blessings, and uh, we say God should bless this year, the bounty of this year, the yield of this year. Um, in, an, in a more agricultural time, that meant the crops, but today mm -hmm. it means means our uh, whatever it is, our, our stream of income. Um, of course, we ask for that. And again, let, let's go back to, to what we're saying before about mission. If you don't think through how materiality plays a part in your mission, then you have this sort of vague notion of, well, I guess it'd be nice to have stuff, but you don't really know why it's important. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's like, why would I, why would I pray for it? And you're right. <laughs> but what I'm saying is not that pray for it if you don't understand why you need it, but maybe stop a second. And before you pray, understand more what your needs truly are. Mm hmm and, and maybe even before you try to think what your needs truly are, think about what you're needed for. And once okay. you figure out what you're needed for, it's sort of logical inference what you might need in order to do what you're needed for. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of introspection that needs to be done before we even pray. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that are like almost by reflex that we, that we know we want to pray for, you know, the, the, we, the, the well-being of our loved ones. Those things are just so natural. Um, we don't have to reflect on it. But what I'm saying, sometimes, you know, think about it like this. Like, let's say you had a meeting with, with a big CEO, with somebody, you know, uh, who's, who's, who's running a multi-billion dollar company. And, and you've got a 30-minute meeting with him or her. And, and you could lay out any request you want. You're going to plan for that meeting. You're going to think, you know, strategically, what would be a smart thing to ask for? So 
Yeah, there is such a thing as just praying from the heart spontaneously. Absolutely. But then there's also sit down and think about your life. You know, reflect upon your your story, where you've come from, where you're heading, what the trajectory, um, what you think you still have. What, what potential is there that's, that, that needs to be maximized? And start thinking in those terms and then pray. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll surprise yourself that you may be having in mind certain material resources, uh, maybe even very specific material resources, like a particular property, let's say, that you feel would be conducive to your mission. But I, I, I think, you know, spend some time thinking about your story, about your role, about your mission. And then I think it sort of becomes clear on its own what role various different material resources are gonna have. But again, it goes back to the mission. Yeah, it goes back to that. And as I'm hearing you say it, I'm just imagining, imagining how beneficial it would be for couples, for married couples to embark in financial conversations, not just looking at numbers, but really getting very clear on this individual and collectively together. What is our mission as a family? What are the values that we want to emulate that we really want to live by, right? What is it that we want our financial resources to be financing? What is of the essence? These are important conversations to be talking about with your spouse. We should have talked about them when we're dating, but let's just, it's, 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 it should be an ongoing conversation. Um, yeah, the word I would use there is values driven. I was yes. talking about mission before, but you know, values, like what do we, values really mean ideas that you use to prioritize when you need to make decisions mm -hmm. like where do you see what a value is to you when you're forced to make a choice yeah when you're not forced to make a choice it's not so clear what your values are but when you have a situation where i can't you know let's take something really easy that's just an obvious example i can i can be honest or i could be uh you know i can i, I can uh do something that's advantageous for me, you know, make an extra buck, but dishonestly. Okay. So then I'm confronted with a dilemma. Do I choose, what do I value more an extra buck or my integrity? Uh, integrity, right? Okay, mm -hmm. fine. So that's when it, that's where it becomes clear what my values are. Then there are things that are more subtle where you have two good choices. It's not the choice between something good and something immoral. Maybe there's two things and they're both important. Um, like, do I want to focus more on, you know, I give you a classic Jewish example, but like something like a Torah study or prayer. So mm. if I have another minute that I can devote to my spiritual connection, should I spend it studying Torah or should I spend it praying? You know, so they're both good answers. They're both good options, but like you have to understand like what for you at this moment has greater value. So Let's apply that to, you know, a family having a mission statement and knowing, like, what is our family about? What, is, what are our values? Um, what are the causes we want to be involved in? What are the causes we want to support? Where are the areas we want to shine? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are things that everybody does, and they're universal. But then there are areas where people sort of have an extra, an extra exuberance. And those are the discussions that need to be part of your your family's mission statement so like i was mentioning before a person who says i want to have a really open home i want to be in you know very hospitable home therefore we need, need to have a big home okay but that starts with a values discussion between uh, a husband and a wife saying you know is this a value we have maybe that's not the value maybe we yes if you know Everyone has to do hachnasas archem. Everyone has to have guests. In fact, it's this week's Torah portion. Uh, Abraham has guests, the three angels who come visit him after his uh, circumcision. But so everyone has to do that. But who says it ha we have to be the ones who make that our, you know, our uh, our forte or mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, our special uh, area of, of excellence? So those are discussions you want to have as heads of a household as, as co-parents as a, a husband and wife what are our family's 
values? What are the areas where we want to shine? And then it becomes clear what material resources are going to be supportive yep. of implementing those values. Now, maybe one of your values is that I want to have a simple life. I don't want a lot of material possessions. You know, our sages say, if the more possessions, the more worry. Fantastic. That's perfectly fine. I, I would never tell somebody to, to feel like they're missing out in life if they are perfectly happy with having very simple material resources. But hold on a second. We said already, it's not for you. It's for your mission. Mm -hmm. So even if you want to live simply, which is terrific, doesn't mean you don't need money. Your mission is still going to cost money. I want to tell you something. I'm not going to use names here because it's this is public. In, but um, so I go around before COVID a lot more. The, that kind of shut it down. But I go around speaking a lot. Yeah. And so I've seen hundreds of communities all over the world. And sometimes what people ask me is, oh, did you see that shul? Did you see that shul? You know, like, is it an impressive building? Uh, and, and I want to tell you, so like, after seeing hundreds of different buildings and, and, and shuls, synagogues, um, I'm not impressed with somebody who has a big building. Mm. I'm not impressed because there are a lot of nice buildings. You know what? I, I, I developed a metric. This is just, this is the first time I'm talking about this publicly. <laughs> and this is just for my own private, uh, until now, I guess, it's been, been for my own private uh, amusement. But to me, what's interesting is not who made the nicest building or the biggest Chabad house or the biggest shul or the biggest school, or the biggest community center. But what's interesting to me is the ratio <laughs> between the rabbi's building that he built and his personal home mm -hmm. because there are people they live in a palace and so the synagogue is also a palace mm -hmm. which is fine because sometimes that's actually needed for the mission there are people who in order to cater to a certain segment of society they have to be living in that type of environment and have to offer that level of, of, uh, of comfort. Uh -huh. and, and I want to tell you something, rich people need rabbis too. So there's no reason this, you, you shouldn't penalize the rich people by not catering to them. We do all types of things to make people comfortable, right. To, you know, give them the chicken soup and then, and, and, and say L'chaim and sing a song and get people comfortable in order to give them a spiritual message. So there's nothing wrong with, if you're catering to a clientele that needs a certain level of material comfort, so there's nothing wrong with the spiritual leader having that mm -hmm. in order, you know, to cater to that crowd. But if you don't need it for your mission and you're happy with a very simple life, to me, that's the neatest thing where you see a guy who put up an amazing building hmm. and his personal home is very, very simple. Mm -hmm. That blows me away because there you see, it really is about the mission. Now imagine if that guy would say, well, I'm simple. I have a simple home and therefore I'm going to have a simple synagogue. I'm going to have a simple community center. So because you're simple, these thousand people in your community should suffer. Mm. <laughs> Right? Like, why, why are they suffering? It, it reminds me of a story that a, a, a rich guy came to the, the Magid. The Magid was the disciple and successor of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was, was the first leader of the Hasidic movement, and his disciple and successor was, was the Magid. So there was this rich guy who came to the Magid, and um, the Magid asked him an interesting question. He asked him, what do you eat for breakfast? And a very interesting question. What do you eat for breakfast? And he said what he thought was a very impressive answer, even though he was very wealthy. He says, I eat a very simple breakfast. I, 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 think, I think he said, I eat kasha, you know, I eat buckwheat. That's it. No, no fanfare, no nothing. So the Magid told him, you should have meat. 
at breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's very indulgent. See, the guy, he was a spiritual guy. So he, he wanted to show the Magid that he, he wasn't indulgent. I, don't know, I keep it very simple. He said, so the, but the Magid says, no, I, you should have meat. You should have a few dishes, you know, have a nice, have a nice breakfast. Right. So the guy left and one of the students asked the Magid, why did you tell that guy that? Like, why, why was that important spiritual advice for him? He said, because if the rich man eats buckwheat for breakfast, hmm. he'll think the pauper who came to the door to ask for a handout can eat stones for breakfast. Wow. <laughs> wow. So it's not about you. It's not about you. Get over yourself. It's not yeah. about you. Yeah, so true. It, it boils down to that. It's not about us. It's not about the ego. <laughs> it's about what we're meant to be doing in this world of service. What am, what am I needed for? Why am I here today in this moment? Well, going back to abundance, if we look back, we see, talk about Abraham before, right? We see a promise of wealth for the Jewish people. We see that Abraham left Egypt, went down to Egypt, left with tremendous material wealth. We see that we left Mitzrayim, Egypt. We crossed the Red Sea. We, we left with wealth. We got more wealth at the Red Sea. We built the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle with that wealth. Do, ultimately, does God want that for the Jewish people? Does God want that we should be materially abundant as a nation? One of the things Maimonides says about the Messianic era is that all the delicacies of this world will be as abundant as dust. Mm. So we, as the Jewish people, believe in a, in a mission of perfecting the world. Perfecting the world doesn't just mean spiritual enlightenment. It means in the most plain material sense, no war, no poverty, no illness, everyone living in prosperity. Mm -hmm. you know material prosperity is part of our messianic vision it's not a spiritual heaven if that's all god wanted he would have kept kept our souls in heaven he wouldn't have bothered them to come down to here to the physical plane but we came down to the physical plane to perfect it and to make this world holier than heaven and part of that is uh, material abundance mm -hmm. but uh, but i'll tell you also the labav Rebbe, blessed memory made a very interesting observation he said when Maimonides says that in the Messianic era, the delicacies will be as abundant as dust, so the Rebbe said, not only will they be as abundant as dust, they'll be as interesting as dust. Hmm. Meaning to say what does that, mean? that the problem, it, when there is a problem, is not that you have nice things. It's that you're too interested in that. There See, you a tool is just a tool for getting a job done. When you start to put the hammer on a on a pedestal, like it's a mm -hmm. museum piece. Oh, look at this hammer. Look at this amazing hammer. No one cares about your hammer. The hammer did its job, bang, bang, and knocked the nail into the wall, and it did its job, okay? The same thing with money. Money is just a tool, a very powerful tool. When you glorify the tool, oh, look at the tool that accomplished the job. No, I don't care about the tool that accomplished the job. Show me the job. Show mm -hmm. me the fruits of the labor. So... It's, it's interesting because material abundance doesn't mean that we'll have a focus on materiality. It means actually the, con the, 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 actual, the opposite. It means the, 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 to the contrary, the, the, that, the, that we'll have everything we need for the mission. We'll have all the tools, all the resources that promote the mission where we, we won't even have to focus on it. Mm. And our minds will be free to focus on, on spiritual aspirations. And, and, you know, I, I think that's sort of like the mentality you were talking about before about people who sort of sh shun materiality, thinking that it's piety. Mm -hmm. I think they think that, well, that'll free me to be focused on the spiritual. Right. But uh, how about abundance as a way of being free to focus on the spiritual? <laughs> In other words, it's not the stuff that's weighing you down. It's your emotional attachment to it. Mm -hmm. But what's the solution to having... A, a proper relationship with the material world and not an unhealthy attachment. The solution, the real solution, the false solution is to be an ascetic, you know, just to, to, to deny the world. But the real solution is 
mission-based, values-based, um, need-based uh, approaches to here is what is supportive of my mission in the moment. Mm -hmm. If it's not supportive of my mission in the moment, then it's a distraction. And even when it's supportive of my mission in the moment, if I start to get enamored with it in and of itself, that's also a distraction. But when I regard it as, as utilitarian, when I, see, when I say, oh, that's an effective tool, right? I could, I could put a million dollars to good use right now. Not because yeah. I'm so excited about a million dollars, but I'm excited about the values-based accomplishments that the million dollars could, could do, mm -hmm. like, like the hammer. It's not that I care so much about the hammer. I'm trying to put up a house right now. I need to bang in a few nails. So a hammer is what I need. So a million dollars is what I need. A big house is what I need based on what it is that I'm doing right now, based on what the, what the mission is right now. So I, I, again, we keep coming back to this, but if you're clear about your mission, if you're clear about your contribution, um, the healthy relationship with a healthy relationship with the world around you is going to automatically follow. Right. And I think for anyone listening already, it's starting to sink in, right? Like the, um, the, 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 the cognitive, wow, like this is, this is really, they're understanding it and, and maybe they're feeling it already. Now, if we want to get really practical with people, what, what does this translate? What do people need to be doing so that this really becomes part of their being right part of their that the abundance mindset really becomes something that they that they get on a practical level does it mean gratitude list does it mean uh some special meditations during prayer does it mean given meister systematically what are some things that people could be doing that really brings this home for them and really changes this perspective around wealth and money i mean you tell me how unfiltered i can be <laughs> completely completely <laughs> Okay, and, and and we're speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience here. Yes, or, or ladies, everyone? Jewish ladies, Jewish ladies. Okay, so unfiltered speaking to Jewish ladies. I'm going to tell you very simple. When your relationship with the material world is is refined, mm -hmm. then your relationship with with money is going to be seamless, smooth, healthy. It's not going to become an obsession. Mm -hmm. But how do you have a healthy relationship with the physical world? Start really, I remember I talked before the concentric circles. Yes. Okay, start with the, with the center of the circle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, start with the food you eat. Hmm. Food isn't just fuel. It's not just stuff, you know, for calories. Sanctify it. Okay, and that means the, the kosher status of the food. Sanctify it. Uh, it means when you're cooking, to have a, uh, have a pushka, the container for tzedakah, for giving charity in the kitchen. Uh, preferably put it on the wall so it's part of the room. It's installed to the actual uh, edifice. And before you cook, you know, give a few coins to, uh, to charity. It means sanctifying uh the most personal aspect of your of your physical life which is the the, the marital relationship sanctifying it it's not just a it's not just a physical thing it's a spiritual thing so bringing uh the laws of mikvah and family purity into into the marriage or enhancing those laws or the mm -hmm. observance of those laws people are going to say well what the heck does that have to do with money it has everything to do with money has everything to do with money. We need to start first with the most basic, like I said, the center of the circle, how my physical body is interfacing with its biological needs and doing it in more than just an animalistic way, sanctifying mm -hmm. it, making it values-based, making it spiritual. So if the marital relationship and you're eating and drinking, which are you know, basic re reproduction and eating is, you know, that's what animals do, right? Mm -hmm. That's the most basic physical thing. But if you can do that in a spiritual way, you're totally changing your relationship with the physical, mm -hmm. which in concentric circles, moving outward will change your relationship with wealth. Amazing. So start, start with that. 
Start with those two things, I would say. Amazing, amazing. Rabbi, you run a very popular parenting course online. Um, I'll ask this for the, the mothers, the parents and the audience. Very often we see that, you know, a, a couple or a parent, hopefully they're together, they are working on changing their financial mindset and their habits, and they're really implementing new, new things, bringing the, the mission, the purpose, really trying to allocate their, their money in a way that's more, more values driven and aligned. And then I see that they face some sort of resistance because changing is not just about themselves, but it also is going to change the way they've parented in a way, the way they've gotten their kids used to a certain, certain life standard, or, you know, they don't want to yeah. deprive their children because now they're deciding to do things in a different way. And I see that resistance. What do we, what can we say to parents um, facing that? Look, all parenting is transmission of values, authentic transmission of values. Um, and as you grow and you evolve, your values hopefully will, will grow and evolve as well. So it's, it's inevitable that there's going to be changes for the better. Um, and lessons that you wouldn't have thought to teach your children a year ago you're gonna, are going to be very important to you today. Mm. Um, what should you do? You should uh, be locked in and say, whatever I valued, whatever I appreciated, uh, at the time this child was born, that's what I'm forced to continue teaching them. What if I know better now? You know, if I know better, I'm going to teach better. And that's part of the humility of being a parent is uh, to admit to our children that we're learning and we're evolving. Beautiful. We didn't address this, but there is an important element here to this conversation, and that is the role of trust in God, of bitachon. Um, how can we use this tool to our benefit? Well, let me let me keep it real simple because um, trust in God is a very broad topic. In fact, I, I gave a class um, about a year ago for I think it was forty five classes just mm -hmm. on this subject. Oh, you know about this? Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> out of a talking classes. Yeah, soulwords.org/trust. You go to my site, soulwords.org slash trust, and you have, I think it's 45 or 46 lessons on uh, the gate of trust uh, from Chayvah Salavavis, from Dudas mm -hmm. Adar. So there's, obviously, there's 45 lessons worth of stuff. And I didn't even say everything over there. So there's much to be said about, about trust. But let, let, let me keep it very simple. Um, you know what I was saying before about having an unhealthy attachment or fixation or a yeah. focus? One of the benefits of Betochen, among the many benefits of Betochen, is to be able to have an involvement in the physical world without becoming emotionally fixated on it. Mm. So Betochen is, is, is an emotional tool that frees us up from forming unworthy attachments, like things that don't really deserve that much attention, mm -hmm. shouldn't get that much attention. Now, when, I'm, when, I, when my trust in God is weak, and I actually think that my sustenance comes because some guy decided to be nice to me today, right? I actually make him my God. And I think his, his decision is going to decide whether or not my maker will be able to sustain me today, right? some absurd notion like that. So then I become very emotionally fixated on that relationship and I have mm -hmm. to make sure that that person likes me because, because my, my whole, you know, my whole prosperity will depend on this one guy's decision, which is patently ridiculous, right? Like never depends on that guy. Um, he's just, he's just a conduit. It's just a, you know, a, a pipeline, right? But when I think that this deal, right, this deal has to happen. If I don't get this or this job, I'm getting a salary from this job. If I wouldn't have this job, I, I, I would be impoverished. I would never have another income stream, right? Those, those little idols. And they really are, they're, they're idols. Yeah. Um, so what happens is we become really emotionally attached to them. So one of the, I said, among the many benefits of, of trust in Hashem, but one of the, the chief benefits is 
you get to disconnect from those emotional attachments. You don't have to feel like those things are so worthy of your time and your thoughts and your attention and your worry. It's like you show up, you do it because we have to form a natural vessel in this world because God likes to remain anonymous. So mm -hmm. we have to provide, provide him a cover, an alibi, plausible deniability. So he can say, no, I didn't miraculously sustain you, even though we know he does at every moment, right? So we're just trying to provide an alibi, but don't get so emotionally attached. So that's, that's what trust, there's so many benefits of trust, but one of the big benefits is that you can put your mind and heart where they belong, which is in your relationship with Hashem. And, uh, you know, you show up for the things you got to show up for as a responsible adult, mm -hmm. but without this, you know, sense of exaggerated emotional importance. Amazing. And, and when you say your relationship with God, I, I want to go back because I know this like triggers for so many people. Like, what was he saying that does that mean prayer? Does that mean Torah? I, I want to bring it back to it's all of it, meaning it's service based. What am I, my relationship with my creator, as in what does he need from me right now? Why am I here every minute constantly? Right, right. right. So the, the, I'll go back to the word we used before mission. Yes, mission. exactly. A relationship with God and mission are synonymous. Exactly. What do you think your relationship with God is? See, I think that's a problem. Going back to what we talked about before about spiritual materialism, people think the relationship with God means how much reward in the world to come they're getting, mm -hmm. which is itself a fixation. Yeah. And it's, it's not that much better of a fixation than how much money I could make in this world. It's, it's mm -hmm. still just acquisition. It's just mm -hmm. what can I amass for myself? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Flip the whole thing. A relationship with God means mission, purpose. I came to the world to do something, to make mm -hmm. a contribution. Now, obviously, when you do good, you receive good. Yeah. And there's a cause and effect, and there's reward in this world and the next. Mm. But that's not what we're focused on. You know, in 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 Pirkeovis, in the ethics. It says, don't be like the slaves who serve their master to receive a reward. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say there isn't a reward. There is a reward. That's why it has to tell you, don't fixate on it. If yes. there wasn't a reward, it would just tell you, there's no reward. Just do it because it's the right thing. The trick is, though, it's so difficult. There is a reward. Mm -hmm. Doing the right thing will benefit you in this world and in the next world. And you have to be strong enough to say, I'm not going to fixate on how it's going to benefit me, even though I know darn well how much doing the right thing does come back to me in a good way. But I'm going to try to ignore that and stay mission based. I love it. Let's wrap it up, Rabbi, with what I call Jewish money matters, fill in the blanks. And this is a part of the show where I'll give you an open ended statement and you'll finish it with the first thing that comes to mind. OK, OK. All right. Number one is when I give Meister or tzedakah, I like to give to. This is real for me. Yes, you, Kailu Rabbi Sheistel. When you I give Kailu Chabad, that is a, a charity that was made by the Balatanya, by the first Rebbe of Chabad. It supports the the needy in in the Holy Land. Yes, I'm a big we fan. Kailu Chabad Pushka on on the 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 table where my my wife uh, lights Shabbos candles. She always gives to that every week. That's like my go to tzedakah. I get yes. to a lot of places, but that's like go-to. I'm a big fan as well. I'd like to make more money because. I, I want to spread the message. I want to help more people. I want to reach more people. Amen. I'm making this really personal. I'm just yes, it. it should be. It should okay, be. Okay. <laughs> so I'm actually, you want to know something? Yeah. I just got off the phone with uh, Charity, who's uh, they, they're uh, uh, a, a fundraising platform that I've used successfully in the past. We just set the date for my uh, yearly fundraiser for November 12th or 13th. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a, it's a Saturday, Sunday. I'm doing a program. I'm going to be trying to raise my yearly budget. And uh, I'll tell you, there, there's, there's anxiety about it because it means I got to call people and I got to make the ask. But uh, how did I get over it? I just thought about what I'm going to do with that money. And once yeah. I realized, you know, once I remembered who that helps and how it helps them, it's like... It's, it's, it's very easy to pick up the phone and make that ask. Yeah. Now, if I thought I was going to go and buy a nice car with it, 
then maybe <laughs> it would be hard to get over the awkwardness. But I know exactly what that money is going to and who mm -hmm. it's benefiting and how it's benefiting them. And so, it, you know, it's much easier and, to oh. And by the way, going back to what you said before, if the nice car would serve you in that mission, then- Yes, 100%. That's right, that's right. And like, <laughs> I, I know I have a friend who became a moil, does circumcisions. So he asked a veteran moil, like, give me, give me advice, like in being a moil. He says, get a good car. <laughs> Because they drive a lot. They drive a lot. They drive a lot. He says, get a nice car, a comfortable car, a reliable car. Don't spare any expense on getting a good car. And he got himself a really nice car. I think he got a Lincoln Navigator. People are all oh, so fancy. What are you talking about? This is my vessel. This, this is what I need. Now, I don't need that because I'm just going back and forth to the airport. But if that's what your, your bread and butter is, yeah, of course. Makes perfect sense. Excellent advice. I like it. We need to get you in first class then because you fly so much. I do fly business class. I, there you go. Perfect. 100% I do. Perfect. Now, I want to tell you something. I flew with my family. We went to KMR for, uh, for Sukkis. So for that, when I flew with my family, I flew economy because I fly with my family. And it was mm -hmm. on the way back anyway, so I didn't care if I was going to be tired. But if I'm going to a speaking engagement. It makes a huge difference. Of course. Uh, I'm I, going to speak better if I know. I'm business. I know for myself as well, like you get to a place, you're exhausted, you have to get on stage, the adrenaline, you've been drained from the, it's not the same. It's not the same people. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Something I wish I'd learned about money growing up is. Mm. Wow. Wow. I, I, you know what I, I wish I, well, I don't know if I wish I knew it growing up because I think God has his timing, right. right. but I certainly didn't realize this growing up. I had no comprehension as to how much money is out there that's not being put to use. Wow, nice there point. There is so much money out there looking for a purpose. Mm -hmm. It's insane how yeah. much money is just waiting to be put to use. Yeah. Well, listen, if we go back to the source of it all, right, God is infinite. God has all the money in the world. We just have yeah. to literally channel it in the right places, right? Yeah. yeah. Money, spiritual or physical? Both. Excellent. Both. It's like asking, it's like asking me, am I spiritual or physical? Right. Right. Something I splurge on unapologetically is? Business class tickets. Yeah. I, I knew it, right? When I was saying, I'm like, business class tickets. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi Taub, spender or saver? Saver, saver, yeah, yeah. And, and not saver like uh, investing, but saver like um, I always have my the checking account that I'm writing checks from, paying bills from, always has to have a pad. Hmm. I'm not going to tell you my... Yeah, yeah, I get it. Number, but I have a number that doesn't count. That money isn't there. That's just to make a pad. Because mm -hmm. I can't go down to the wire. I can't mm -hmm. handle that type of adrenaline rush. That's not what I, I'm not looking for that kind of excitement. <laughs> a certain amount of money I pretend is not there. Today, I'm most grateful for. So much. I'm grateful to be alive and have, have, have everything that, that life brings. Mm. And finally, I'm Rabbi Shays Taub, and I believe Jewish money matters because? Because we have to perfect the world. We have to bring Mashiach already. And that's going to happen in this world. And to do that, you have to use the resources of this world. Yes. Thank you, Rabbi Shays Taub. Tell everybody where we can find you. Soulwords.org. That's, that's my home on online, soulwords.org, S-O-L-W-O-R-D-S.org. Very nice. And they can be in touch with you. They can learn about your online programs. They can watch your class recordings, all of it there. Thank you so much for all your work. Keep us posted about that charity campaign. Um, yeah. We're here to help always and support a good cause. So, and thank you for your time and your wisdom. Thank you. Okay. Amazing.